Hi everyone, my name is Michael Page. I'm a SpaceX fan, but also the CEO of my own small startup company, Exodus Space Systems. And like the rest of the industry, I have a strong interest in where SpaceX is going with their new Starship prototypes. This video is in response to several of the threads on the NASA Space Flight Forum. And for my own sake, it's just to uh, update my 3D models of the Starship as we know it currently and then hopefully drive further discussion about what can be done with the Starship going forward. Here you see the simplest version of Starship, the, the Chomper model, which can both deploy large payloads into zero gravity environments, and in the absence of a payload, it can serve as a refueling tanker to the main version of Starship. But what does that look like? As I've gone through this modeling process, I've found it really difficult to reconcile the listed figures, 150 tons landed, 50 tons returned, with the idea of a dedicated crew or cargo starship. After all, wouldn't a dedicated cargo starship want to unload a full 150 tons onto the surface of the moon or Mars if it could? Or alternatively, wouldn't a dedicated crew vessel need more than 50 tons to support the crew on their return? For me, it makes more sense to have something more akin to the Dragon. One third pressurized volume for crew, and two thirds unpressurized trunk for cargo. Also, I should just clarify that in my version of the model, based on the figures in the specs thread I listed earlier, I only get a total volume of about 750 cubic meters, not the 1000 cubic meters you'll see elsewhere on the internet. It was thinking about the psychological implications of these volumetric considerations which led me to create this formula uh, to try and clarify how I was intuitively thinking about the relationship between the maximum number of people you might want to contain in a given volume over a certain amount of days. You can see how this applies to Crew Dragon on the left here, where seven people can fit, but that might become uncomfortable after much more than a day, whereas two people could be comfortable for up to a fortnight. So, using the formula as my guide, knowing Starship's calculated volume and expected trip time, this is what led me to design for 12 people, and is a version I think could be used in the Dear Moon mission. Let's start with solar panels, which I've designed this way for a couple of reasons. The first thing you'll notice is that the Starship is oriented perpendicularly to the Sun, and these panels deploy vertically, meaning that they serve as a sunshade for the entire Starship, hopefully reducing the need for radiators in general, and especially keeping those landing propellants cool. The area of that sunshade is about 30% of the ISS, and the reason I'm keeping them in this unpressurized trunk section is that that means they'll be able to be deployed to a moon or Mars surface the same way as every other piece of unpressurized modular cargo. So how do we get this down to the surface? Well, you need a crane. And in this case, the crane also has a platform on it so that either crew or cargo can be deployed down to the surface and brought back up into the Starship if necessary. Okay, so let's have a closer look at this airlock module, which is pretty much the focal point of this design. I've made the side walls of this module see-through, so you can look inside and see the 12 acceleration couches where the crew will spend launch and landing. The chairs are able to pivot to deal with the belly flop maneuver, and my intention is that this is basically a wholly self-contained module that in the direst of emergencies could be ejected from the Starship. That's not to say I'm looking at it as a launch escape system, which has been discussed to death and has many problems with it. This is more an in-space lifeboat that could be deployed in the event of an emergency such as a piece of debris puncturing a header tank and sending the entire craft spiraling wildly out of control. I think it's really important that there's some way to abandon the ship and be rescued without putting yet another starship in danger trying to dock to the original starship. So that brings us to in-space docking, and you will already have seen that I have a hatch on the outside of the docking module, but you might wonder why we don't just open that up and have a, a docking port behind it. 
And the reason for this is that the common berthing mechanisms used on the ISS and in most spacecraft have an active half and a passive half, which means that if you've got two of the same spacecraft, like two dragons, they can't actually duck to each other in space because they both have active halves. So that's why this airlock module has four CBMs, two pairs of active and passive halves. So you'll see in this cross section that I've extended this design choice active half facing up, passive half facing down, not only to the um, airlock modules, but also to the cargo modules. So that means that the cargo modules are able to be accessed while during cruise to the moon or Mars and able to be stacked once they're on the surface. Also, note how even when the airlocks are extended, the rear pair of ports is still aligned with their respective ports inside the ship. One thing I really like about this pairing of ports is that it means that starships can be dovetailed while they're in cruise phase, so you can have up to three starships all docked together in this big collection. Okay, last part of the video. Um, just going to quickly run through how I'd imagined the crew layout in the pressurized section of the uh, vessel. So 12 crew, you can see it's actually pretty cozy. You've got three levels, and the first one of which is this airlock module. So if I just select that, you can see how as that extends out again, uh, just showing again how these rear airlocks, when it's fully extended, can adopt to the ports of the workshop above or the cargo modules below. If we pull out um, the front half of it, you can kind of get a better impression of the space within the module. So just going through the next most obvious things, you can see the big blue blob in the middle is meant to indicate the water stores, uh, the radiation shelter, and I suspect the kitchen. The red elements then indicate utilities, so batteries, carbon filtration, anything that's necessary to the general function of the ship. Next up on the second level is the workshop in the foreground there, directly accessible from the airlock after EVAs, and that goes for everything on the second level, which is anything that might generate dirt or moisture or smell, so bathing, toiletries, exercise, and all of that surrounds the radiation shelter, which is purpose-built to shelter the whole crew in the event of a solar flare. And lastly, on the top floor, just below the oxygen header tank, is where I've put what is effectively a Japanese pod hotel. Each pod is slightly smaller than a regulation pod, about 70 centimeters by 90 centimeters by 1.9 meters, but they're designed to give every crew member their own dedicated space for the duration of the trip, which is another thing I think is really important. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Uh, here's a cross-section in case you wanted to see that. Uh, but I'll finish it here and hope to see you in the comments.